Duolingo is a language learning platform with over 200 million users. I've personally used it to learn some Spanish. On a daily basis, millions of users receive customized language lessons targeted specifically for that user. These lessons are generated by a system called the Session Generator. Andre Kenji Hori is a senior engineer at Duolingo, and he wrote about the process of rewriting the Session Generator, moving from Python to Scala and changing the architecture at the same time. In today's episode, guest host Adam Bell talks to Andre about the reasons for the rewrite and what drove them to move to Scala, as well as the experience of moving from one technology stack to another. Cloudflare runs 10% of the internet, boosting the performance and security of millions of websites. Many of you probably already use Cloudflare on your sites, but we're not talking about using Cloudflare today. We're talking about building on top of it. If you're a developer, you can build apps which can be installed by the millions of sites which rely on Cloudflare. You can even sell your apps. They can make you money every month. Your users can log in or register to your service inside your app. They can get a real-time preview of your tool live on their site, and they can start paying you monthly, all from within Cloudflare apps. They can go from never having heard of you or your service to having it installed on their site and paying you in seconds. Visit cloudflare.com slash sedaily to watch how you can build and deploy an app in less than three minutes. That's cloudflare.com slash sedaily. Thank you to Cloudflare for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Andre Kenji Horie is a senior software engineer at Duolingo. Andre, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Oh, hello. Yeah, welcome for inviting me. Yeah, you have a, a great sort of case study about the, the rewrite work that's been done at Duolingo. But before we get into that, I was wondering if you could explain what Duolingo is. Yes. So Duolingo is a language learning app. We have around 200 million users as of today. And in the app, uh, well, people can learn how to, well, can learn a, a new language by doing exercises and translating sentences from their uh, language they're native on to the language they want to learn. And then we have other exer exercises that uh, practice uh, listening skills and some reading skills, some grammar skills. It tries to make it sort of a game to learn a new language. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, we have all of the uh, gamification mechanisms such as hearts, levels, experience, <laughs> all of that to make the language learning experience more engaging because uh, when you're learning a language, that's the sort of process that takes people like several years to become fluent in a language, right? So by gamifying it, we make it easier for users to keep learning and keep engaged so that they can achieve this um, very long-term goal. Mm -hmm. how, how big is the engineering team at Duolingo? Engineering team should be around forty to fifty people, maybe. And and how is how is that organized? So we have uh, several teams. So we have some product teams, which we call product teams. For example, we have the learning team, which is the team that focuses on on improving our learning metrics, improving the learning experience to users. We have, for example, our growth team, which is concerned with uh, expanding our user base and keeping people engaged. And we also have some more uh, foundational teams, like for example, uh, Q&A or operations. Which team are you on? I'm in a team called uh, the architecture team. So it's basically guaranteeing that we have a, a healthy code base or a healthy system in terms of the, in the application level. So would your tasks be around sort of setting standards around what languages are used or what frameworks or things like that? That also, so languages used, uh, also maintaining like common frameworks and libraries for the rest of the company to use, uh, making sure that the architecture as a whole is healthy and each microservice is, is doing 
correct things <laughs> and not abusing our infrastructure. <laughs> you, you were involved in a rewrite of the session generator. Could you explain what the session generator is? Uh, yes, absolutely. So, um, well, when a user is learning Dolingo, they, well, they will need to learn so how. So we give users exercises and we have a pool of exercises, which is pretty large. So uh, actually, let me take two steps back. Uh, we have a, a product called the Incubator. And in that product, we have volunteers making the courses, the, the courses that are you're going to see. So it's like a crowdsource, crowdsource approach, and mm-hmm. you know, we, the volunteers will input all of the data and will make the, the course structure and, the, and write all of the course content. And then the session generator is responsible for uh, pulling all of the, of the data and picking the exercises that will be the most interesting for the user at that point and give it so giving in a session that is bite-sized and no small for the user uh, to do let's say in a bus or wherever they are so a session is like a unit of learning and the the session generator creates that that unit yes that's correct a session is well (laughs) simply speaking is a collection of exercises okay so is this session generated on the fly or is it created ahead of time part of it is on the fly uh, we have a lot of pre-processing going on because it's there's so much data involved in each session that uh, if we do every every single step on the fly then that's uh, very time consuming why couldn't all the say spanish sessions be be created ahead of time is there is there inform- uh, yes <laughs> so we also want the sessions to be adaptive for each user, right? So for example, let's say a user knows 10 words that, and some other user knows 50 words. So the sessions for these two users will be different. And also we take into consideration uh, how, how likely they are to remember a word and other things like that. So it's very important for these sessions to have this um, online component. How do you figure out when somebody's going to remember a word? So we have a model for that. So there is uh, this thing called the forgetting curve for a word. And it's uh, basically the probability that a user will forget or will remember a word after a period of time. After they've learned, let's say that one day later, they have a probability of remembering that's X. Two days later, the probability will decrease. And so we model that as in a curve, and then we do um, some sort of uh, regression to estimate how well uh, the user knows each of the words. So if I if I learned that like garçon is man today, then I you figure out based on certain probability. Like I'll probably know it tomorrow, but not next week, and then you you reintroduce it. Yes, that's correct. So. Why did you decide that a rewrite was required? So you have this session generator. It it takes into account these kind of forgetting curves and builds a lesson mm-hmm. on the fly, I guess. Mm-hmm. So why did you decide you needed to to rewrite it? Yes. So so it all starts with the monolith, I guess, <laughs> and all of the the nightmarish stuff started with the monolith. So uh, we have the monolith, and it's written Python, and the thing is that. In the first years of a startup, uh, we are all thinking of, well, let's move fast, let's ship quickly. And after some years, we end up adding a lot of dependencies like uh, data stores and other services and whatnot. And in the end, the entire system becomes very, um, well, the performance is not so great anymore. And also the, the site's not as stable and that's so one of the reasons is to uh, re-architect the whole system so that the system is more robust. And the, well, the second reason is that we have, well, we have the code in Python. And well, Python is a great language for, you know, writing things quickly and having like prototypes ready very fast. But for systems that are very large, that have like very complex data structures and complex algorithms, then Python is not so great because, you know, for let, 
let's give an example. So something as simple mm -hmm. as dynamic typing becomes a nightmare because then you don't have all of the niceties that you have in a strongly typed language because the compiler won't do as many checks, for example, and then the developers lose confidence in writing code and then they have to spend a lot of time testing and testing to see if all of the possible corner cases are being caught and nothing's going to break in production. So let's see if I understand it. So we have this giant uh, Python monolith. So as you add new features, it, it keeps on growing. Mm -hmm. You're saying the problem, the problem with Python is when you want to add when you want to add something new, like your level of confidence is low because of uh, dynamic typing. Could you do you have an example maybe to explain that? An example? Um, sure. <laughs> okay. So, okay, I'll give a, a very simple example, which is uh, let's say we want to rename a function, and I mean you could do you could grab your your entire code base and start changing stuff, right? But it's also possible that in some part of the code, you pass the, the that function as a lambda, and it has a different name somewhere, and then your code breaks into production. In production, or for example, if you want to add another argument to a function, then you have to guarantee that also nothing is going to break. But then it's also very hard to find all of the occurrences, or that your or for example, even sim simple things as you don't know what data type you're getting into a function. So you can assume you're getting something, but in the end, you're getting something else. And these are all things that a simple compiler check could figure out and say that you're doing it wrong. But since Python is, doesn't have that, then it's very easy to break stuff. Mm -hmm. Did, did unit tests uh, help with this process at all, or were there tests? or? Uh, so, so we do for part of the code. Yeah. So unit tests definitely help, but in the in the starting years of a startup, I guess people are more concerned about shipping things than writing unit tests, and mm -hmm. it gets just stated that even parts of our code base are very difficult to mock with a unit test, or part of the monolith. Because after a while, we we learned the the from our mistakes and realize that, oh, we, we can architect things in a different way that makes unit tests easier. But in the monolith, there are still many places where it's very hard to write unit tests, very hard to mock things. Especially, yeah, if, if you didn't have unit testing in mind, sometimes you make decisions that make it hard to add them after the fact. Yes, that's, that's very true. So when you decided to do this rewrite, what made you choose Scala? Yeah, so there were some reasons. Well, the first is that our infrastructure is built on top of AWS. So yeah, we needed to think of the languages that are natively supported by, by Amazon, right? And they are, well, Python, JavaScript, Node.js, JVM-based languages such as Java, Clojure, and Scala. And I think Go is also one of the supported languages. And well, JavaScript has the same problem as Python. It's weakly typed. We're in, and this is something that we wanted to avoid for the, the particular case of the session generator. And then Java is, well, it's well known. And there, it's a bit slow and verbose to, it's slow to develop and it's very verbose. So we wanted a mm -hmm. more um, more modern programming language, which is why we thought that Scala was a good a good might be a good choice, and also because Scala is also very mature in the backend and it's uh, used by many applications in the uh, big data domain. So and big data is kind of similar with what we're dealing with the session generator, right? Because it's like there's also like a lot of data, complex data structures, complex algorithms, and that's it seemed to be a very good fit. Mm -hmm. Was there any concerns about the learning curve of a language like Scala? I mean, it has a reputation for being somewhat complex. Yeah, so we, we had concerns. Right now, since our, well, our, our entire engineering team is small and the number of people dealing with Scala is also small, my population of people who <laughs> learn Scala here in the company is also very small. So I don't know how good uh, we can talk about like how, how easy it is, but up until now, I personally thought it would be harder for me and for other engineers to learn Scala and to, to 
get going, but it was surpri- well, it was a lot easier than we anticipated. Let's discuss some of the features of Scala that you found useful in your rewrite. Mm-hmm. So oh. could you describe uh, referential transparency? When we have uh, referential transparency, we have a method that the, the only thing it does is calculate the output and doesn't change any state anywhere. So it's very easy to unit test and to also to just logically debug what's going on because you know that once you have that uh, once have some input, uh, the output will all, always be that one, always be what you're expecting, yeah, or what. So it's it makes things very easy to test, to reason about, and that's one thing that's very good once you have like very complex data structures. The octopus, a sea creature known for its intelligence and flexibility. Octopus Deploy, a friendly deployment automation tool for deploying applications like .NET apps, Java apps, and more. Ask any developer and they'll tell you that it's never fun pushing code at 5 p.m. on a Friday and then crossing your fingers hoping for the best. We've all been there. We've all done that. And that's where Octopus Deploy comes into the picture. Octopus Deploy is a friendly deployment automation tool, taking over where your build or CI server ends. Use Octopus to promote releases on-prem or to the cloud. Octopus integrates with your existing build pipeline, TFS and VSTS, Bamboo, TeamCity, and Jenkins. It integrates with AWS, Azure, and on-prem environments. You can reliably and repeatedly deploy your .NET and Java apps and more. If you can package it, Octopus can deploy it. It's quick and easy to install, and you can just go to octopus.com to trial Octopus free for 45 days. That's octopus.com, O-C-T-O-P-U-S dot com. So an example, just uh, it's helpful for me if, if I and probably the listeners if I can tie it tie it back to an example. So referential transparency means you have a function with some amount of inputs. So let's say like my what the the words that I know in Spanish, and then the output is. Or do you do you have an example of where that could be used? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so let me think. Okay, so let's say some part of the algorithm, we are thinking if we should choose a, an exercise A or an exercise B, and we put both in the, into the function, pass them into the function. And so what happens with referential transparency is that first there, there are not going to be any side effects. So we won't write things to the to the database, for example, because that will be adding a side effect. Or we won't be changing something inside one of the objects because that will also that doesn't contribute to the output, right? And the the idea is that we will just do some calculation and we that calculation will be used only for the output. So let's say if we wanted to pick between two two exercises, we will the well the output is simple, it's one of them, but the, we can guarantee that nothing else is going on. Which is what makes it easy to reason about. Yes, correct. You you also mentioned, and I think it ties into that example about immutability. So how does immutability yes. tie into this? Well, immutability it, it, it's if you think that your data sh- like when data is immutable, for you, you have some nice properties. Like you don't need to think about, you don't need to think if something is changing your data from somewhere else. And I, I think many people have seen <laughs> you call a function and then you pass an object to a function that function calls and that function calls another function. And somewhere along the way, someone changes one of the properties. And then you don't know who changed it, what what it changed to, and you just need to like add print 
uh, print statements all over the place to figure out what is going on because something changed part of your data and you don't know why. So when you have immutability, you're guaranteed that, well, things won't change. So all of your, in each step of your algorithm, the state will be very clear to you. So, and what this means in the context of Scala, for example, is that in each step of your algorithm, what happens are, is only uh, data changes. So you, let's say you have a list and you change uh, the elements of a list by, let's say, adding one to, to some property. And then you know that in your next step that the, your new list will have all of the elements with plus one. And you know that you're guaranteed that that's going to be that forever. So if you use that variable for something else, that value will always stay the same. Mm -hmm. So, but you did say the list, we're adding an element to it. So how, how can something be immutable uh, when we're adding <laughs> to it? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Uh, so what we do is we actually copy the list. So we have the original list, we have the new list with plus one in all the elements. And then we keep just transforming data as we go. And that's a way that functional programming happens is that you, you will always, you will always generate new stuff, but you won't be changing what you had, because if you change what you had, then it's, it becomes hard to, to understand what's going on once you have a giant system. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is like Scala's immutable collections. And you're saying the immutable, immutable control structures means when you, so when you write your session generator, nothing's changed. If, if a number of lessons come in to the input and we need to select one, then that one comes out the, out the other side? Yes. Another example would be, let's say, if you pass, for example, a, you have a set of exercises, and in one part of the algorithm, you want to filter and consider, let's say, half of these exercises because they're better in that context. So you filter your pool to, to half, and then you do whatever you have to process. But then in your next step, you wanted to use the, the actual like full set of exercises, and the data is there because you, you have not touched it. You created a new, a smaller set in the previous step, uh, which if you want, you can use it or not. But the idea is that your, your variables always stay the same. So if you want the that entire pool for the next step, you're guaranteed that nobody changed it, nobody removed things uh, without without you realizing. Mm -hmm. To make this rewrite work, um, like it's quite a different model of operation. So did you have to change the architecture of the session generator so that it could work more as a, you know, transforming inputs uh, rather than, you know, mutating them? Yes, yeah, so we, we did change. So many of the algorithms we had to, we had to just rewrite them in a immutable way. Sometimes when the algorithm was way too hard to, to rewrite and it was like risky to introduce errors, then in those cases there's, so Scala has this nice thing that it's, or I don't know if it's nice or not, people <laughs> might disagree, but so, so it's, you can write, so it's almost, it, so you can port Java code to Scala and just run Java libraries in Scala because all of them, both of them run on top of the JVM. And what this means is that Scala also supports things from the Java world. So like mutable types and some for loops, while loops that are not very uh, functional in this, in this sense of functional programming. So if you are rewriting something and then you realize that, oh, this is, will be very hard to rewrite without adding complexity or making risky changes, then you can write in a more uh, Java-like idiom of Scala. What percentage would you say is more of a, you know, Java written in Scala and what percentage is a, did you kind of go with this functional transformation style? Uh, so in our code base, I'd say that more than 99% is functional because we try to do things in a more, so when you're using immutable collections and we're using um, referential transparency, things are much easier to, to debug, much easier to maintain. So we try to make things immutable and 
very functional, transparent, and you know, functional in general in most of our code base. Most of our code bases, maybe one or two algorithms, we thought it would be better to just use the uh, non-functional version. Wow, ninety-nine percent is quite a. It's very functional. <laughs> yes, I, when you're writing a, a code base from scratch, you can also do unit tests that you couldn't do in your monolith. <laughs> so it things are much easier to just test that that your algorithms are working as expected. How how is unit testing in in Scala? So yeah, so we use our in Scala, our, our, should I say, like in our our whole framework. So we use a. Uh, Finatra as a our HTTP server, which is uh, Finatra is the HTTP server written by uh, Twitter, and we and they use uh, Juice, which is the uh, Google library. And so unit testing for in this context, we we have like all dependency injection out of the box. We have mocking out of the box, and it's very easy to do everything. And I'd say that it's well, it was just easy to write unit tests and we end up writing a lot of them. And I think our coverage right now is somewhere along 70% maybe. Nice. So back to the, uh, the architecture, what is there, is the session generator, you mentioned microservices, is, is it something that calls out to a bunch of services and combines them together or how does it interact with the rest of uh, Duolingo's infrastructure? Mm-hmm. So we do have a lot of, so we have to pull data from a lot of places and we have a data pipeline for that. And it's, so the data pipeline is right now, it's a, just a task that runs offline so that we don't, you know, so that we don't make real online traffic depend on our data stores, right? So we have this, uh, so we have this task that runs daily and hits all of the services and whatnot that we need to hit in order to fetch the data. And then this task pre-processes everything and then serializes all of the data into all of the, this pre-processed data into S3, which is a file server by Amazon mm-hmm. AWS. And then when we are when we are in online, we're serving actual requests for users, what we do is we just fetch from from the file server and cache it in memory and serve it. And when we do that, we get we have a an architecture or a system that's very robust to to failures because the only your only real dependency is your file server and well network of course but and also uh, it's also very fast because everything is cached in memory so the only real external dependency you have is is s3 and then even that is kind of insulated by your cache yes yes so with with all this functional functional idiomatic code you're writing, does that mean the session generator is sort of like it, it takes as an input like a user and then all of the the possible lessons ever and then it spits out like what they should learn next? Is that a little bit. <laughs> so it actually takes as input. So the online part of the session generator takes in, as input the lesson the user wants to learn and some other user settings and outputs the 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 session to the user. So the the collection of exercises. Okay. There's an idea that statically typed languages are are more verbose and dynamic languages are more succinct. So I, I've actually found in my experience uh, that Scala is a very succinct language, maybe even more so than Python in some cases. Um, how, what did you find in terms of verbosity moving from one language to the to the other? Yes. Yeah, so I think ver- verbosity depends a lot on the of the uh, language itself. And so if you're familiar with Python as your, uh, or Python or JavaScript as your go-to dynamically typed language and Java as your statically typed language, then I would agree that yes, because Java is super verbose. But then we have uh, uh, Scala is a language that is concerned about, you know, a lot of typing. <laughs> so there are many, they try, so Scala tries to infer types whenever it can. Uh, sometimes it can't and make some errors here and there, but usually it's able to infer your types, sometimes infer other things that you, the compiler can infer. It makes, like Python, you can do list comprehensions and write things, write one-liners instead of write, like in Java, you need to write three or two, five lines of code just to do a for loop. 
And so, yeah, so its color is very, very succinct. And you, there's not as much typing as, as a language like Java. And compared to Python, I'd say, I don't see... Oh, yeah, in some cases, the Scala is more, it's less verbose. For example, when you're defining a class, you don't actually need to write much. Basically, if you don't need a body, you don't need to write a body for a Scala. Are you, are you using implicits within your code base? We are using, uh, so in Scala, there are two kinds of implicits, the implicit parameters and the implicit conversions. And well, so the implicit parameters is when you when you basically define what some of the parameters of your method as implicit, and then in your as long as you have an, within the scope of the caller a variable of that type that is also an implicit variable, it's declared as implicit. Then you are able to just not write the code to pass that value into the function. So it's basically to avoid typing. So for those, we do use uh, implicit. We don't use uh, implicit conversions because we usually find that a little bit scary because you know <laughs> you won't see when things are being converted. So generally, no implicit conversions, but we do use implicit parameters. And uh, what's an implicit conversion? Yeah, so an implicit conversion is when, well, so you have an object of type A, and then let's say that you want to convert it to an object of type P. There is a mechanism in Scala that you can define. You can define your conversion from type A to type B, and if you put that conversion in your scope, you're able to convert it from A to B without say without writing code to convert things. Mm. So it could be very handy and save on typing, but also maybe you don't know what's changing to what. Yes, yes. In my experience, uh, Scala code can be less prone to uh, runtime bugs. Um, I think you mentioned you had some issues with runtime bugs getting to production in Python. So how did this change now that you've rewritten? Yes, so in Scala, we do have a lot less uh, runtime bugs. Part of it is because your compiler will just get most of the errors. So as long as compilation passes, you pretty much have, well, you don't have like programming errors. You have like application logic bugs here and there, but that's another uh, problem, right? So, so the compiler does a lot of stuff for you. And also the unit testing framework is also very user-friendly. So we can write a lot of tests that just, just that makes sure that your code doesn't have like the most common uh, application logic errors that you'll know about. So in the end, the it's very hard to have these uh, runtime bugs uh, going on in Scala. Mm -hmm. What did you find to be the pain points of of moving to to Scala as a language? Pain points. <laughs> that's a that's a good question. So I was actually more fascinated that Scala is a, like a, as a modern language, it has so many nice things that we don't have in Python and Java. <laughs> that, that kind of outweighs pain points, and there are some pain points, but I would say that they're not actually like the language itself. Itself, there are some small things here and there in, in the language, but those are it's not a big deal. There, most of our pain points were, let's say, uh, we have a library in Scala that it's like underdocumented, or we have a function that's available in Python by default or in one of the common libraries and it's not in Scala. So there are like some small things, but I guess that that's true whenever you change a code base from one language to the other. Nice. You mentioned there's some things about the language that fascinated you, such as? Ah, okay, uh, let me see what are the things. So. I think one of the things is well, functioning functional programming in general, and how how easy it makes uh, your your how easy it makes to read to make how how readable it makes your code, because and also all the all of the since it, the language is not too verbose, the end result is that your code is very explicit on your application logic instead. Of having like a boilerplate of you know just like 
controlling your loops or things like that. And so I find the code in Scala, in Scala very readable, and that's uh, nice. It's also very easy to just look at the code and see if there is a problem because you know it's all immutable and it's it's just easy to debug even without running any code. And also, yeah, so I, I, I originally started my life as a programmer in Java. And then, you know, when you're in Java and you move to Python, the first thing you think you're to yourself is that, oh, this is a lot less verbose. <laughs> it's much faster mm-hmm. to write stuff. And then there's also that difference. Like Scala is very, it's very fast to write code. So in the end, I, I spend my time not only writing code, but all of the that extra time that I would either spend, you know, ty- just typing in Java or or testing things in Python. I write, I I use that time writing unit tests in Scala, and in the end, it's that confidence thing. You can write code and be confident that things will work as the way you expect. are building a data intensive application. Maybe it involves data visualization, a recommendation engine, or multiple data sources. These applications often require data warehousing, glue code, lots of iteration, and lots of frustration. The Exaptive Studio is a rapid application development studio optimized for data projects. It minimizes the code required to build data-rich web applications and maximizes your time spent on your expertise. Go to exaptive.com slash se daily to get a free account today. That's e x a p t i v e dot com slash se daily. The Exaptive Studio provides a visual environment for using back end, algorithmic, and front end components. Use the open source technologies you already use, but without having to modify the code, unless you want to, of course. Access a k means clustering algorithm without knowing R or use complex visualizations, even if you don't know D3. Spend your energy on the part that you know well, and less time on the other stuff. Build faster and create better. Go to exaptive.com slash sedaily for a free account. Thanks to Exaptive for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. It's a pleasure to have you on board as a new sponsor. So you're back on the JVM. So you got tired of the JVM and you left and now you're back, but the language, the language is, is more fun. (laughs) Yes. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Is, I think you mentioned this, but do you you find, is it faster to write Scala slower, but, but worth the trade-offs or compared to Python compared to Java? I'd say that for, it's a bit slower than Python, but there, there, there are caveats on it, right? So it's slower to write a piece of code, but then the amount of effort you have to maintain that code and to test that code is a lot lower in Scala. For me, it's uh, in the long run, Scala is just a faster language than Python. So not faster to initially develop, but faster like the all-in, all-in time. That... Yes, yes. So, it's... so how about maintenance? So maybe maybe you don't know. Maybe this is so knew that you haven't had to do much maintenance of it but well uh, so yeah so we haven't done that much maintenance because yeah the 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 system is very new whenever we have to like refactor something it's very easy to because you know your IDE does does it for you basically <laughs> so you don't even need to think about it you just click two buttons and that's it <laughs> so the compiler gives you confidence i would imagine too or around these these refactorings because you know, you get some sort of error checking. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. So I remember the first time I had to refactor some stuff in Scala, I was just surprised that in Python, it would take me like, I don't know, an hour or maybe not an hour, but, you know, a lot of time. And in Scala, I finished in like less than one minute. And I, I was just so surprised. <laughs> I mean, it's the sort of thing that you, after working with Python a lot of, a lot of time, you just, you just become so, so used to that, that, Whenever you have something nice, you're like, oh, that's that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Scala being on the JVM should 
in a lot of cases, be much faster than Python. Did you have any sort of numbers about that? I wouldn't say like, so we haven't actually done any tr- benchmarks that you would be able to trust, like that compares the exact same code in one environment or in the other. The one thing that we have going on is that we, well, we have written the whole system, the whole session generation in Scala. We have also, you know, re-architect things, but, and some of the performance gains that we saw was, so from re-architecting and using the in-memory cache and, and using S3, we, we decreased latency from, I don't remember, the name, it was maybe 700, 800 milliseconds to things to the order of tens of milliseconds. So it, it was like more than 10 times. It, that was very good. <laughs> the number, also the number of servers that we need to, to use to serve the this, this same amount of uh, traffic decreased by, uh, how much was it? It was like to the order of maybe 10 times or so. Wow, so that's a big savings cost to the bottom line, I guess. Yes, yes. And and also just, just the fact that, you know, Scala and well, the JVM in general does better in multi-threaded environments and multi-processing and is able to, to just run a lot of stuff at the same time. It, it's nice. Yeah, so one thing that Scala has that Python does, for example, is uh, it, it's called futures. So what a future does uh, is basically it's unit of asynchronous computation. So whenever you do a request, you'll get the response a future but the value is not there. The value is you're waiting for the value in another thread. So what happens is that you don't block your original thread. And because of that, you're able to do a better job in, in concurrency, for example. And that's what that's one thing that we see in Scala is that our servers are able to, to handle a lot more concurrent requests than Python. Because in Python, you have like UWSGI and whatnot. And then you, whenever you have a, a request and then you're waiting for I.O., that thread is completely blocked. And if you have, I don't know, let's say 20 threads in, in, your, in your server, then you have one less to serve traffic. Is there, is there a Python way to deal with this? Like, or there's just not? Not that I know of, or, well, not out of the box. Maybe you, there might be some libraries that... To, for example, the actor model, which is something, it's the thing that languages like Elixir and Erlang do out of the box too. So it just handles concurrency better. I think there is something for Python as well. There's a Akka, it's a library for Scala. And if I think if you use that, you might be better off, but not, not out of the box, not if you're using like Flask or Pyramid. Mm. It, are you using uh, the actor model in your session generator? Not in the session generator, no, because we wanted to. The interactions with I.O. are very simple in, in our session generator. And there is also the, the overhead to get it set up first because, you know, nobody in the company had that kind of know-how. So we chose to first to do the more common or common approach. But it's something that after you start reading, you become interested in. Are you using uh, actors at all? I, I'm just curious because because you mentioned it. So, <laughs> so uh, we're. I was thinking of uh, implementing that for the for the the offline part of session generator because we we have a lot of data, and in that situation, it wouldn't make more sense to make a to have a data pipeline that uses actors. For now, we still haven't had the opportunity to to do it because you know we're still working on some other things and that's not the highest priority yet. Makes sense. So now that your your rewrite is over, what were the, the business benefits of the rewrite? Like, was, was it a success? Yes. <laughs> so for now, I think it's a success. Uh, it's not completely over yet because we have some, still some features to port, but it's mostly done. I would say it's a success because of uh, we, we, we were able to, to have like those cost benefits and it's just a lot cheaper to to run or to serve traffic with the the written code and the written architecture than the original one also in terms of developer productivity it's also very good because it's a bit weird if i say it but uh, the but my feedback but yeah but the feedback from the other developers is that it it's just 
less painful. <laughs> and I think painful was the word they actually used. <laughs> so uh, what makes it weird? Uh, well, I started the, uh, the whole process of moving to Scala, so I might be very biased <laughs> towards, <laughs> towards the new system. <laughs> So you, you don't find it weird, but other other people do? Is that what you're saying? Or No, it, it would be weird for me to say because I'm biased, but other people, I, oh. I also got feedback from other people that, well, it's less painful. It's it's that thing that I, I talked about. We Like, you can write code with confidence, and I think that's like very important. Okay, I understand. Would the rewrite have been successful or as successful if you had, had, if you had made the architectural changes, but but not the the language change i think partially so we would have with the uh with the architectural change we would see improvements in latency i think in python they wouldn't be as large one reason is because python is is a bit slower than than scala the other reason is that having a a thread safe cache in Python is not as trivial as it, as it should be. <laughs> so I think that's, that, that would be one problem. But also generally, we would lose all of the benefits of, like, of developer confidence of not, breaking, not pushing breaking changes because it's all dynamically typed and it, it would be much harder to make like, larger changes or, or just to know what what the data structures are. What is it like working at a company with such a focus on learning? Like, uh, I think, are you a language learner yourself? Do you, does the company have a learning perspective based on what it does? Yeah, so I, I think it's very interesting to work here. So I am a language learner. So my native language is actually uh, Portuguese. Uh, so I, I was born in Brazil. I'm a Japanese Brazilian, so my native language is Portuguese. Second language is English. I've learned Japanese, and I kind of know Spanish. <laughs> so, and it's kind of it. It's very fun to to you know be surrounded with people who have like the same interests and for learning. There are some people who are learning like a ton of languages, and they know a lot of, a lot of languages. And even uh, with our community, sometimes when we meet some some members of our community it's like very interesting because they have all this uh, view of the world that you wouldn't that you don't usually see in your daily life you know people who who want to who want to learn new cultures learn new languages and they, like have like very broad horizon i'd say yeah i could see why that would be refreshing people <laughs> you know talking to people who have a a global perspective mhm well it's been great to talk to you about this rewrite, and I, I'm, I'm glad it's been a success. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for inviting me. It was, it was great uh, talking to you. At Software Engineering Daily, we need to keep our metrics reliable. If a botnet started listening to all of our episodes and we had nothing to stop it, our statistics would be corrupted. We would have no way to know whether a listen came from a bot or a real user. And that's why we use Encapsula, to stop attackers and improve performance. When a listener makes a request to play an episode of Software Engineering Daily, Encapsula checks that request before it reaches our servers, and it filters the bot traffic, preventing it from ever reaching us. Botnets and DDoS attacks are not just a threat to podcasts. They can impact your application, too. Encapsula can protect API servers and microservices from responding to unwanted requests. To try Encapsula for yourself, go to Encapsula.com slash 2017 podcasts and get a free enterprise trial of Encapsula. Encapsula's API gives you control over the security and performance of your application, and that's true whether you have a complex microservices architecture or a WordPress site, like Software Engineering Daily. Encapsula has a global network of over 30 data centers that optimize routing and cache your content. The same network of data centers are filtering your content for attackers, and they're operating as a CDN, and they're speeding up your application. They're doing all of this for you, and you can try it today for free by going to Encapsula.com slash 2017 podcasts, and you can get that free enterprise trial of Encapsula. That's Encapsula.com slash 2017 podcasts to check it out. Thanks again, Encapsula. Wow.